I'm a California girl. As a child, I spent lots of time in Louisiana, however, because my mother's family was from Louisiana and we would visit often in the summers. I have very fond memories of running around in the woods with my cousins and getting bitten by humongous insects uh, and then also even seeing a ghost when my aunt decided to don a white gown and roam around the house at night to scare us kids who just simply would not go to sleep. And by the way, I did not know it was my aunt until she told me when I was in college. She had quite a sense of humor. So for me, Louisiana was fun. In 2005, however, I returned to Louisiana. Uh, this time I went to New Orleans. And it was after Hurricane Katrina had come and gone and left a trail of destruction. People had lost their lives. The city was in shambles. Communities had been devastated and abandoned. People sought refuge wherever they could find it. Many of us sat at home looking at these images on our TV screens, just wondering how we could help, what we could do. I decided to join a team that was forming at the company where I worked, uh, who along with the Gates Foundation went down to New Orleans after the devastation to help the city rebuild. The team that I was on was specifically focused on the children. How can we build a great educational system and good resources for kids as they re return to New Orleans? It was that time and during that time that I realized how impactful climate events can be. It was the first time that I saw the devastation of a severe climate event and how it affect, affected people and communities. That's what brought me to New Orleans in 20, 2005. The events surrounding Hurricane Katrina created American refugees, American climate refugees. In this case, I worked to help people recover after the disaster, but what it created in me was a desire to help avoid disasters if I could. Climate change is leading to drastic weather events that are increasingly increasing in frequency and in intensity. Events like these are causing destruction and they will only get worse unless we act. My time in New Orleans played a key role in motivating me to devote my life to trying to get in front of problems and more specifically to try to fight climate change. So how does one fight, fight climate change? Well, a few years later, myself and a colleague, Dr. John Reed, uh, that I knew from grad school, we were discussing how we both could have an impact. And we believe that non-governmental organizations, NGOs have a role. We believe that policymakers and regulators have a role. We're, but we're both scientists. And we also believe that science and technology has a crucial role to play. And for myself, my time at the Boston Consulting Group, where I worked to advise executives of Fortune 500 and Fortune 100 companies solve business problems, it was clear to me that if we could create economically attractive solutions with that, that technology and that science uh, that were appealing to consumers and appealing to industry, that businesses could actually scale those solutions and that could be a way to have an impact. So for me and my colleague, Dr. John Reed, we focused on answering the question, how can we use CO2 as a resource? How could we recycle CO2 into value and indeed make it profitable to recycle CO2? And from that, Coverti was born. So Coverti is built on the shoulders of giants. We leveraged work that was done during the 60s and 70s where NASA scientists were asking a slightly different question. Their question was, how do you recycle CO2, carbon dioxide, and carbon on board spacecraft for long journey missions uh, to Mars and distant planets? Well, we haven't yet been to Mars, so a lot of the ideas that they worked on in the 60s and 70s were still just pretty much sitting on the shelves. Uh, so we resurrected some of the concepts, we picked up where they left off, and began developing technologies that would profitably recycle carbon dioxide into value here on Earth in a way that was 
scalable and commercial, commercially viable. What we found is a great way to commercialize these types of technologies was to not just address one problem, the climate crisis, but was to find other problems to address. And several of them have been focal points of us as we've worked with strategic partners to help them remake their supply chains to solve those problems and introduce technologies that would, would uh, be the solutions. One particular area where there's a lot of problems that need solving is around how to feed people. In particular, it is projected that there will be 10 people, in the, 10 billion people, more than 10, uh, 10 billion people on the planet by 2050. And science uh, researchers believe that we will need to increase food production by 70% in order to feed all those people. So how can we do that? How can we scale food, our food production system? Well, one would guess that we should just scale the way we're making food today. However, it is not scalable, not sustainable. And there are a few reasons why. If we just look at the land utilization alone, it turns out that an area that is equivalent to the size of South America and Africa combined has already been cleared for modern food production. And if we need to increase food production by 70%, where are we gonna get all that land? In the quest for land, we've actually removed a lot of natural habitat. And what that translates into is massive extinction of species, insect life, plant life, animal life that we'll never see on the planet again as a result of our quest for producing food. And that's not sustainable. If we look at Brazil, 2019, there were record uh, fires um, and that was primarily for food production. So in addition to the, these issues, there's also going back to the climate issue. It turns out that the food production system we have today actually is a key uh, culprit in the climate crisis. And in particular, there's more greenhouse gases that are emitted in our modern food sector than all of transportation. That's our cars, our planes, our trains, and our trucks combined. So a lot of greenhouse gases are emitted. At Kiverdi, we are focused on creating solutions that will address this feeding 10 billion people by 2050 issue. And we're, we're commercializing solutions with partners. Uh, and some of the solutions we're working on are in making seafood more sustainable um, by getting rid of the wild caught fish as a part of the aquaculture system. So making aquaculture more sustainable in particular as a feed solution. In agriculture, uh, we're taking CO2 and we're making uh, pro biostimulants and bionaturals that are plant nutrients that can put carbon back into the soil, but more importantly, increase the amount of crops that you get per area. So increase yield and do it in a way that uh, makes crops more resilient to uh, lack of nutrients, to low to high stress environments, basically, whether it's nutrient starvation or droughts. Uh, so we're really focused on that and commercializing solutions around that. And then finally, food is one area directly, making that directly uh, in a new way. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a little bit greater detail here. But we're really focused on helping companies remake supply chains uh, in a way that is more sustainable, uses CO2 as a core input, and is scalable uh, and solves broader problems. So we, if we... Um, look at what we're doing as a whole, we're remaking supply chains and we're using carbon transformation to do that uh, at Coverti. So let's double click on that food um, process. So we actually are able to take CO2, take an element of the air and other elements of the air, oxygen, uh, and make food out of it directly. Uh, and this process takes days instead of months in the case of say soy for instance, or years in the case of uh, cows for instance. Um, so really fast food production, uh, we're able to make a protein that's highly nutritious, all the essential amino acids, uh, complete with vitamins and minerals. And the process that we use, it's a, we call it a probiotic production process, but it's similar to making yogurt. But the difference is we're using elements of the air as our, foot, as our input along with renewable power and water. And, and micronutrients. And what we're making is very sustainable, I'll call it ultra sustainable. 
And in fact, one of our partners has said from a sustainability viewpoint, it's a perfect protein. We're excited about that. And if you wanna just look at one of the elements of sustainability, land utilization, it would actually take a soy farm the size of Texas to give you the same amount of protein that you'd get from an air protein farm the size of Walt Disney World. So significantly smaller footprint, uh, less utilization of resources, and much more sustainable. So that's a way of, of making a, an ingredient for food products. To talk about how that's relevant for us today, you know, how can one give a talk without talking about the pandemic, this new reality that we're facing that no one could have predicted. Well, well, no one except Bill Gates, but for the rest of us, this is you know very unprecedented situation for us to find ourselves in, where we are all looking at the numbers, waiting for them, wishing them to come down. We're concerned about our loved ones, and we're you know appreciating the little things a little bit more. So change is a part of our everyday lives now, and our food system has seen quite a lot of disruption. We are seeing the food supply chain uh, experience a lot of changes that will impact the way food is made and those supply chains in the future. Things will not ever be the same again. Uh, we're seeing delivery and online uh, ordering increasing. So online grocers are seeing increased uh, demand. We're seeing local being more preferred a um, lot more community su uh, supported agriculture, CSA uh, companies are, are overbooked and have wait lists. Uh, and so these are some of the things that we're seeing change in a food supply chain. But one of the biggest sectors that have been impacted really is the meat industry. Uh, we've watched as thousands of employees of the meat industry have caught the virus, have been infected. We're seeing closures of plants. And in many cases, we're seeing people not getting the meat delivered to grocery stores and restaurants. We're seeing empty shelves. So the supply chain for meat has been significantly disrupted. So our hearts go out to the people that are being impacted and, and we're all in this together, really. Um, as we see the supply chain disruption, we can ask the question, can we rethink the fundamentals? Can we rethink the meat supply chain. And in order to do that, we'd actually have to start at the beginning. And we have to start with the question, can we redefine what it, meat means? Uh, so instead of defining meat as based on its source, you know, whether it came from a pig or a chicken or a cow, can we define meat based on the collection of proteins and oils and flavors and textures that you experience when you sit down to enjoy a great meal? If the answer is yes, then we can think of other ways to make meat in the future. And as we all know, there are many companies working on this and we're excited about this new uh, alternative meat sector that really is exploding right now. But where do elements of the air come in when thinking about this problem? And more explicitly, can meat be made from elements of the air? Well, the answer is yes. If we look at the protein that we're able to make from elements of the air, then we can use that to make meat. And in order to talk through the process a little bit in a little bit greater detail, let's start back with how alternative proteins are being made today using, for instance, soy. So if you have a soybean, uh, you need an energy source, solar energy. And plants are actually autotrophic, which means that they use CO2 as their carbon source. And so plants get CO2 from the air. You need a place to grow the plant, so you need soil and you have your seeds. And then you continuously add your inputs, your energy, your carbon dioxide, your water, your, your nutrients like nitrogen, and you wait. And in this case, you wait for months. And once the crop has fully grown, then you're able to get the protein from that crop. And then we see the companies today that are using soy protein as an input, as an ingredient to make uh, meat this new category of meat. In our case, we also have energy as an input. It could be solar energy, it could be wind energy through power, it could be hydroelectric power. 
we can use our class of microorganisms, which are also autotrophic, which again means that they use CO2 as their carbon source. And then we need the similar types of elements, more water, we need nutrients like nitrogen. Uh, and then instead of soil, we have a fermentation vessel. So think of making yogurt or think of brewing beer. Uh, and so you're able to take these microbes and these inputs, and then again, just wait as you did with the soybean. And this time you don't wait for months though, you wait just for days. And in hundred hours or so, in some number of days, you then get also a protein source, which then you can apply culinary techniques, temperature, et cetera, and then create the textures and flavors when you add other ingredients that give you the meat flavors that you enjoy and that you love. And we've done this. And happily, we, were, we announced a few months ago that we made the world's first air-based meat. And we're excited about the ability to make something that's ultra sustainable, that has you know, the smallest footprint from an environmental standpoint of the alternative meats, and that is hugely scalable. When you look at the kind of core ingredient, uh, it's very scalable and economically attractive. Uh, but we're just at the beginning. Uh, we are excited to take this technology and apply it to chicken analogs, to beef analogs, to pork analogs, seafood and beyond. It's an exciting time to reinvent the future of meat. There are a number of benefits to making meat using elements of the air. And one of them is related to time. In the case of a steak, it takes a steak today two to three years uh, to be produced, from the calf to feeding, grazing, watering the calf, the cow, and ultimately a slaughter. That takes two to three years. In the case of air-based meat, it just takes days. So we can make meat in significantly less time using less resources. In addition, we, are not, we don't have any climatary constraints. The process uh, happens in a um, similar to making yogurt or making or brewing beer. So you can make meat, rain or shine, day or night, in any climate throughout the globe, whether it's in Iowa or Texas or Sweden, Canada, uh, whether it's um, Quebec or otherwise. Uh, you know, anywhere we can you can grow meat. Los Angeles, St. Louis. Uh, so it's very flexible in terms of how you can deploy it. And then finally, we're able to use much less resources. So we can actually scale vertically instead of horizontally, uh, which allows us to create basically a vertical protein farm uh, that can be deployed anywhere and significantly less land and water than the alternatives. So we've created a business, Air Protein, that's really focused on the future of meat, that's focused on delivering ultra-sustainable meats that are high in nutrition and very flavorful. With this, we're able to reinvent how meat is made and build resilient supply chains that can handle pandemics of tomorrow that are high in, in transparency, very high tech, and define a sustainable way of feeding 10 billion people by 2050. So we started with climate change, trying to address that issue. And among, amongst other things, we ended up creating a new business, Air Protein, that's focused on the future of meat, that has a huge sustainability uh, profile and can significantly impact how we eat in the future. We'd love for you to join us in this journey. We are happy to be a part of a broader ecosystem that is advancing new ways of, of making food and we are welcome strategic partners, advisors, supporters, and team members. So we'd love for you to contact us, go to airprotein.com and get in touch. And we look forward to building the future of food and the future of meat together.